On November 4th, 2013, my friend Phoebe Freer and I visited Roger Brucker at his home in Beaver Creek, Ohio, to interview him as part of our Black Guides of Mammoth Cave documentary project. Only a couple minutes of that interview appeared in the final documentary. This is a copy of the entire interview. Oh, you have pages of questions to ask. Oh, no, this is our previous correspondence. Oh. They're just some points to okay. remind me of. That one's recording. Yeah. This one's recording. Okay. All right, uh, would you introduce yourself and say what date it is just for the film? Hello, my name is Roger Brucker. This is November 4, 2013. We're sitting in my basement uh, in uh, Beaver Creek, Ohio. If I ask you a question, yes. you should say, like, how long have you been a cave explorer? You say, I've been a cave explorer for... Oh, all right. I understand. We want to cover the question. I, I want to be able to cut mm -hmm. me out completely okay. from, from the... All right. Mr. Brucker, you're relatively well known in the caving community to make an understatement. Uh, how long have you been a cave explorer? I've been a cave explorer since about 1951 when I uh, joined a group of cave explorers in uh, New York City and uh, came to Kentucky and in uh, 1953 and uh, explored caves ever since. So this is now 2013. So that comes out to about uh, 60 or so years. You were involved in the original uh, Floyd Collins expedition, Floyd Collins cave expedition with the NSS. Uh, how did that project come about? In 1954, the National Speleological Society had learned of a cave, a very large cave near Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, called Floyd Collins Crystal Cave. And they received an invitation from the owner of Floyd Collins Crystal Cave to explore that cave. There were a number of people who had uh, gone exploring there who were cavers, who. Uh, accepted the idea and preparations were put together for that. I was involved with one of those people who took me on an earlier trip to Crystal Cave. I knew it to be a big one, bigger cave than I had ever seen before. Uh, so I was eager to go. At that time, Floyd Collins Crystal Cave was on a property that wasn't part of Mammoth Cave National Park. Is that correct? Crystal Cave was on an inholding inside the Mammoth Cave National Park and it was a private property at that time. So in hindsight, one of the things that the owners wanted was publicity to probably help increase the perceived value of the property so they might sell it to the uh, park at, uh, at a good profit. There was many years of exploration in Floyd Collins Crystal Cave before it was finally linked up to the Mammoth Cave system in 1972. Uh, was the goal the entire time to try to connect the two cave systems or was it to just push Floyd Collins Crystal Cave as far as it would go? The initial goals had to do with who you're talking to. The owners were interested in simply finding more cave and increasing the perceived value. Some of us cave explorers were very interested in seeing if we couldn't find a connection to Mammoth Cave. Uh, still other cave explorers just went along for the adventure of uh, cave exploring and uh, with no idea of connecting or uh, uh, having that as a goal at all. When you were exploring the cave, did you stop in and say hello to Floyd? I, every time we would go into the cave through the uh, entrance to the cave, we would pass Floyd Collins' casket. And uh, we would say, come along Floyd, uh, you can come with us. It was 
partly in joke, uh, partly in jest, because uh, cave explorers generally are not superstitious, but the thought was uh, he would have enjoyed going on the trips we were heading for. His body since been removed from the cave and buried elsewhere. Yes, some of the relatives of Floyd Collins didn't like the idea of his being buried in Crystal Cave, even though he uh, presumably said that's where he wanted to be buried. So uh, much later on, the National Park Service decided they would acquiesce to the relative's wish, and they had the body and its casket removed and buried in a nearby cemetery. Your book, The Cave Beyond, tells the story of the Foy Collins Crystal Cave Expedition and some of the subsequent uh, explorations in the cave. How did you decide you was going to write a book about your experiences? I uh, had not intended to write a book about it, but we were told by the expedition leader that everybody ought to keep a journal because these journals would be used by a ghost writer to uh, put together a book which would pay for the expedition and uh, would be written under the expedition leader's name. So I duly kept the journal and uh, turned it in at the end of the expedition and uh, heard, thought no more about it. And one day I got a call saying, uh, would you come to New York and help write a book? And I said, what's this about? He said, well, uh, the ghost writer disappeared with the money and the publisher wants either the money or the manuscript. And so we don't have the money to give back. And uh, I said, why me? And he said, well, you're the only person who turned in memoir material. Uh, so. I said, sure, I'll come to New York. So I got leave from the Air Force and uh, flew to New York. And they put me up in an attic in Brooklyn, uh, equipped with tables and typewriters and typists who would come in as, on a voluntary basis. And uh, the, the book was written in a, a short period of time, two weeks, really. And you wrote it with Joe Lawrence, Jr.? Yes, Joe Lawrence Jr. was the expedition leader and the book was to appear under his name. He was going to help write the book but he appeared on the first weekend and said I couldn't get time off so we're stuck and I said well I'll ghost write your part uh, which I did under his name. He wrote the picture captions in the book. So it's kind of a funny story, uh, that starting off writing a book in first person, my part of the book, and as a ghost writer, his part of the book. Well, after about 20 years of exploration, you uh, managed to eventually connect it to the Mammoth Cave System. And that also generated another book on your part, this one with you and Red Watson. Yes, in 1972, we had been, uh, in the previous 20 years, expanding uh, Floyd Collins Crystal Cave to include Salts Cave, Colossal Cave, and Unknown Cave. And finally, in 1972, we found a connection beneath Houchins Valley to Mammoth Cave, making it the longest cave in the world. On the day that that happened, September 9, 1972, uh, Red Watson and I immediately thought we need to write a book about that because that is the Everest of speleology. So I said, well, I'll be happy to work with you on that, but the last time I wrote a book, I ended up as the second author, so I want to be the first author on it this time. So that's why The Longest Cave is written by Roger Brucker and Richard Watson. I found the book very enjoyable to read. It's probably one of the best caving books, or the best caving book I've read. There were stories in there about how you would hide a coin someplace and tell people there was a coin there. If they managed to make the connection, they could go get the coin and use it in the payphone. Uh, there was a joke among cave explorers, and that was that 
in order to create an incentive for cavers to try to find a connection to Mammoth Cave, that I had uh, actually hidden a dime in the restroom at uh, uh, Snowball Dining Room in Mammoth Cave. And I put it on a ledge above the door to the restroom. And I told them when they got there, they should use the dime to call up and inform us that they'd made the connection. We had other jokes, and one would be to remove the picnic tables one by one until they suddenly began to realize they would be missing. Actually, that uh, tells you that in 1972 you could make a payphone call with a dime. Uh, the, the price went up and up. And uh, One day uh, in the 1980s I checked and the dime was gone. So somebody has enriched themselves at my expense. It's terrible. Uh, I don't know how you're going to be able to stand that amount of money being lost here. When you're writing those two books, you had mentioned finding Indian cane torches far from the entrances. Yes. How far from the entrances did you find some of them, and what kind of passages do you think the Indians were really actively exploring it just to explore the cave? Well, we know that uh, prehistoric uh, peoples, uh, the, these predate present-day Indian tribes, we know that they explored deeply into Mammoth Cave and into Salt's Cave, and we know that, uh, and that's been known for uh, probably 170 years, because of the remains they left behind of, of reed torches burned, which they used for light. Uh, we found torch materials in Unknown Cave uh, shortly after we had made the connection to that cave. We found several things, not only burned reed torches, which indicated that they had come in from an entrance uh, perhaps only three or four hundred feet away, now closed, but we also saw some bare footprints in the mud, uh, a, a larger individual and a smaller individual, which we uh, assumed to be a, a, an adult male and perhaps a, a boy or a girl female. The connection that eventually was made between Mammoth and Flint Ridge was through a passage that actually appeared on one of the older cave maps drawn by Stephen Bishop. Can you explain why no one had been down that passage before? The discovery of the connection route is a very interesting one because shortly after we discovered that this passage is shown on Stephen Bishop's schematic sketch map of Mammoth Cave as coming off of Echo River. In a subsequent map that was an accurate survey in, in 1907, that passage is no longer on the map. And what happened in between was that a dam was built in Brownsville that raised the water level, and most times of the year that passage was underwater, which is why it didn't appear. In 1937, some explorers uh, who were working for the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, were on a bounty system from the state who was running Mammoth Cave at the time. And if they found new cave, they would presumably be given a bonus for finding more cave. Well, two of them uh, found the water low one day in Echo River and went up this passage nearly a mile and a half and uh, put their initials there and their names on the wall, came back and reported to the superintendent of the cave that they had found this marvelous extension of the cave and they wanted their bonus. Well, according to them, the director said, well, I'm sorry, the rules have changed and we no longer pay a bonus, but you can tell me where it is. And they said in 1937, if you want to find out where it is, you go look for yourself. We're not going to tell you. Now, one year later in 1938, those two cavers and some of their relatives found a marvelous part of the cave called the New Discovery, which eclipsed anything that was in this. So the story was that the, the passage disappeared after Stephen Bishop knew it was there 
because it was mostly flooded by water at the time. You decided to write about Stephen Bishop and his life in a fictionalized account of his life with his wife and his exploration of the cave. What motivated you to uh, write this book? One of the things that has intrigued me is a cave guide called Stephen Bishop. Stephen Bishop was a, an African-American guide, a slave who was brought to the cave in 1838. When writing The Longest Cave, I had written a long historical appendix uh, looking up and utilizing all of the factual information that had been written about Stephen Bishop and put it into the appendix. But none of what has been written before captured the passion and the obsession of the cave explorer. Well, as a cave explorer, I felt that that was a, uh, a remedy uh, waiting to happen, and I wanted to tell the story of his interest in exploring, his curiosity, his ability to uh, go where people had not gone before. Uh, so that really led to the book, but there was a paucity of information really beyond what I had already written. So that uh, just screamed for a fictional uh, a historical fictional approach. And one of the things I learned early on is that to write historical vic fiction you must visualize a river of narration and there are rocks in the river which are facts and you must run the river around the rocks and not through them. So a good bit of the work in writing that book had to do with the background of the times, the conditions of slavery in Kentucky, and a great deal of other research. Some people have suggested that Stephen Bishop explored the cave because that was his job to explore the cave. Do you think he explored it because it was his job, or do you think he explored the cave because he liked exploring the cave? I have no doubt that Stephen Bishop explored that cave because he loved to find new things. I think he uh, had the same emotional attachment to caving that modern day cavers have. They want to know what's around the next corner. They want to know if they can discover a part of the cave that nobody has seen before. They had, and He of course had experienced the thrill of, of crawling into places and discovering a wonderful place. It was named Goran's Dome after his owner at the time. And so for that he was celebrated. So I'm sure he was encouraged to continue his exploring and he did it in a systematic way and uh, we know that because he drew a map of his discoveries uh, which uh, is still looked at today and as a schematic map it's pretty good. You found new passage yourself in a lot of caves. What would you say is your biggest discovery and your most memorable discovery that, of what you found in your years of caving? Well, let me start with the most memorable discovery I've made, a, a place called Lost Paradise. In 1954, during the NSS expedition, I uh, crawled into a tiny crack and wriggled my way through mud and came into a place where there was a fossiliferous limestone that was made up entirely of crinoid buttons and, and crinoid stems. Crinoid is a, an ancient sea animal. Uh, and I had never seen uh, fossils in such pure form and so many of them. And I named it Lost Paradise because it, to me it was wonderful. And I remember on the way back, the ledge collapsed and I was left holding on to a tiny handhold, which I was able then to retreat to a more secure spot and wait for somebody to come and yell and say, where are you, uh, and to tell them I was in trouble. Well, nobody came, and after a while I decided I would better slide down this rock and keep going in the direction I had going. At that point, the light went out, my carbide lamp on my helmet, on a muddy slanting rock into a pit. So part of the memory of that 
I, I must tell you, I did get out alive, but uh, and I made it in the dark to the other side of this pit. But uh, so that discovery was memorable in that sense. I think probably uh, the most important discovery I've made is. Uh, finding pieces of this route uh, that eventually turned out to be the connection route. Uh, these are not giant pieces of the cave, but they're nevertheless important links in tricky places where you had to look in just the right place and behind the right rocks. I came across a reprint of an article that said originally appeared in a southern magazine the other night, and it says that there was a group of tourists in a boat in Echo River, and the, they were between the landing points, and someone swamped the boat and all the lights went out. And that uh, reportedly it was Stephen Bishop was the guide at the time, and he made sure they held onto the boat and didn't move so they wouldn't get lost in the river someplace. And several hours later, Matt Bransford came and looking for them because they Tour didn't show up and found them and rescued them. Does that seem like a real reasonable thing that might have happened or does it seem more far-fetched? I think that's an exaggerated story because having been in Echo River and at the time Stephen Bishop was there it was three feet lower than it is now so it was easy to wade so anybody falling into the water would simply wade to shore uh, with Stephen guiding them. Uh, we know that because when Stephen discovered Echo River he found that if you stick to the left hand wall you can wade the length of uh, uh, that passage. There's been a bunch of stories told about Mammoth Cave. Some of them were pretty far-fetched and some seem reasonable. Uh, are, are there any of these favorite guide tales that you found particularly enjoyable? Well, one enjoyable story was the <coughs> uh, discovery of uh, Crevice Pit and the fact that it uh, went down a long way. Uh, Crevice Pit had been known long before Stephen Bishop got to Mammoth Cave, and allegedly uh, uh, guides had been lowered on a hay rope, and uh, there were other instances in uh, describing that people knew it was very deep because they could not just only hear water falling in it, but when they threw rocks in this crevice, uh, it was uh, three or four seconds before they hit the bottom. Now, the pit was discovered from the bottom by Stephen Bishop, who found his way through Sparks Avenue, uh, coming off of River Hall, shortly after he discovered the way across the bottomless pit. So he came into the bottom of this pit and uh, we suspect that he found a battered lantern or something that had been thrown into the pit from above and by simply pacing and having a compass you would know generally where you were in the cave. And we know Stephen did that. There was later in the 1870s, probably 1870s, they found the, the corkscrew, and I guess that was guy William Gavin found it. And what was the importance of finding the corkscrew aside just a, a quick way to get to The discovery of the corkscrew many years after Stephen Bishop was a guide in the cave was an important <coughs> uh, route uh, that enabled uh, the management to offer a, a better tour. It used to be that all the tours in Mammoth Cave went in from the entrance and came out the same way. In other words, people would go to some remote part of the cave and then have to retrace their steps. In this case, it set up what amounted to a circle tour where you could go in the main entrance, uh, proceed, in the cave to the giant's coffin uh, down into the lower parts of the cave across the bottom of this pit and through River Hall and finally back out Sparks Avenue 
uh, at the beginning of Sparks Avenue is the beginning of the corkscrew. Climb up through the corkscrew and be back to the entrance in a matter of uh, 30 minutes. So that shortened the trip and made it much more interesting. In the early 1900s, there was a lot of competition between different caves that were operated commercially and, and Mammoth Cave. These were known as the Kentucky Cave Wars. Could you tell me a little bit about what the cave wars were and uh, what some of the commercial caves were operating at the time and what did Mammoth Cave do in, say, in retaliation to the uh, pirating of their visitors by other cave operators. Part of the commercial history of Mammoth Cave has to do with the cave wars. The cave wars were essentially fierce competition between cave owners. Mammoth Cave had been established for many years, ever since 1795 as the, the big cave in Kentucky, but people began to find other caves nearby. Uh, Short Cave, Long Cave, Proctor Cave and so on were found, and those became the basis for cave rivalries. And uh, then in, in 1915, an enterprising oil prospector came along by the name of uh, Morrison, and Morrison uh, more or less sneaked into Mammoth Cave and did some mapping on his own. He bought a drilling rig and he opened up what he called the new entrance to Mammoth Cave. That was when the cave wars reached zenith. He was an entrepreneur of the first sort. He would put road agents out to stop cars and uh, when people said, uh, oh, we're going to Mammoth Cave, he would say, oh, it's closed for repairs, but we have a brand new entrance and we have wonderful formations, stalactites, stalagmites to show you, and a wonderful new hotel. So he siphoned off somewhere between a third and a half of Mammoth Cave's business. Well, Mammoth Cave uh, sued to stop him from using the name Mammoth Cave in his publicity. Uh, he won that case because he convinced the jury that he did indeed have a piece of Mammoth Cave as he unrolled the map to prove it. Uh, the management of the historic part of Mammoth Cave were furious and they said uh, uh, we'll appeal. So they appealed in Kentucky and they lost again. This time the court said well we think that uh, you Mr. Morrison should attach a disclaimer to all of your publicity and your advertising that you don't show a part of the cave that is the historic part of the cave. So he used that to his advantage by saying, we do not show any part of Mammoth Cave that is covered with soot and smoke and devoid of formations. In other words, he trashed Mammoth Cave with his disclaimer. The story goes on to the discovery of other caves, Great Onyx Cave uh, and Floyd Collins Crystal Cave, in Great Onyx Cave in 1916 and, and Floyd Collins Crystal Cave in 1918. Those were uh, a part also of this cave war with solicitors on the road uh, trying to steer people to their respective caves. Foy Collins was an interesting character who met an interesting end and he continued to play a role in the uh, activities after his death. Well, tell me about Foy Collins. Floyd Collins was the son of a farmer who lived on Flint Ridge, uh, about three, three and a half miles from Mammoth Cave. He was one of several brothers and uh, sisters of that family. He was interested in caves from the time he was a little boy, and uh, contemporaries described him as a person who knew no fear that he would uh, crawl out on a limb of a big tree near the Green River and crawl out there and like a squirrel jump to the next limb of the next tree. And, uh, but at any rate, Floyd had a reputation for poking into caves all around. And he uh, found a Crystal Cave in 1918, 
the winter of 1918, he signed a letter of uh, agreement with his father because it was well known that people would uh, cheat each other out of caves and he didn't trust his father. So he said, if I find a cave on the home place, can I have half the profits? And his father said, well, yeah, you've been looking for years. So I'm sure I'll sign that. So he did and discovered uh, Crystal Cave, which was a very, very pretty cave with many gypsum formations, but it was way off the beaten track. It was hard to compete with Mammoth Cave, which was nearer to town. He continued to discover uh, small caves, but he realized that Morrison had leapfrogged Mammoth Cave and had found a new entrance to Mammoth Cave closer to town and was skimming off the profits. And so he thought the way to make money in the caving business is to find a cave closer to town than the new entrance to Mammoth Cave. He approached three farmers and he, uh, who lived on Mammoth Cave Ridge and he made an agreement with them to try to develop a cave and he would split the profits uh, with them. So he went to work on a, uh, for a couple of weeks digging in a place called Sand Cave. Uh, one day he didn't come back to the home in which he was boarding and the, the uh, farmer began to miss him so he went out to look and discovered that Floyd was trapped in Sand Cave. This begins the saga of the attempted rescue of Floyd Collins, which in 1925 electrified the world because the newspapers covered it at a time when very little was going on. Calvin Coolidge was president, uh, World War II had concluded, and so in the 1920s a lot of news was uh, not happening. So every paper, every wire service sent reporters to Crystal Cave to cover the story. For uh, two and a half agonizing week, uh, dispatches were sent about the progress or lack of it in trying to rescue Floyd Collins. Late in February of 1925, the people trying to rescue Floyd Collins uh, were digging a shaft and they reached his body to find out that he was already dead. Um, but that sensational story was uh, has been described by newspaper people as one of the most sensational stories between World War I and World War II, uh, rivaling the Lindbergh solo crossing of the Atlantic Ocean and the Lindbergh kidnapping of his baby. Uh, but Floyd Collins uh, really was one of the early starts of yellow journalism in this country. Okay, um, from the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a major explorations going on in Roffel Cave nearby Ruffle Ridge by Jim Borden and some other people. And um, eventually the two caves were connected. Could you tell me something about the... There are other large caves surrounding Mammoth Cave and uh, some of the explorers who had been involved with us in uh, trying to connect the Flint Ridge to Mammoth Cave got to looking at the topo map and decided that under Fisher Ridge and Eudora Ridge, there ought to be a big cave, maybe bigger than Mammoth Cave. So they began in earnest. Jim Borden and Jim Kearns formed a, a group called the Central Kentucky Karst Coalition, which is a pretty big name for two people, uh, but it began to expand as they looked in one cave after another trying to get into this cave system. It took them a couple of years before they found a way in from a property owned by Jerry Roppel, and that uh, led them through a series of domes into a cave system that began to develop uh, at a rapid rate. 
Well, when a cave system starts to grow as a result of discoveries, it attracts cave explorers. And so many, many people joined that effort at trying to find a big cave uh, that would rival Mammoth Cave. Now, part of the story in, in order to goad new explorers to come was that Somehow uh, they had a cave bigger than Mammoth Cave and that uh, the Mammoth Cave Cave Research Foundation crew were trying to scoop their cave, meaning uh, find a way into it and uh, take it over, so to speak. Actually, part of that was hype on the part of Roppel Cave people because the Cave Research Foundation realized that uh, this cave was developing very slowly and it would take years and years and years to survey a cave bigger than Mammoth Cave. So it was largely a one-way rivalry, if you will. Uh, after a while, the, we began to find passages that connected other caves. Proctor Cave was connected with Morrison Cave and then that was connected with uh, Mammoth Cave, and in the course of that, a huge underground river was found, which was named Logsdon River. Well, Logsdon River rises in Roppel Cave, and some dye traces has proved that it's all one river that comes out on the Green River at Turnhole Bend. So it was inevitable then that the caves would be connected. The Roppel people were not interested because for many years they had the second longest cave in Kentucky. Uh, then one day a third party, not related to Cave Research Foundation or Roppel Cave, came along and he said, you guys are nuts. Uh, why don't you connect this cave and if you're not going to connect it, I will. And this was an individual who was known to be a good caver and probably could have done it. So at that point, the Roppel Cave people approached the Cave Research Foundation and proposed that we uh, go ahead and, and connect the caves before somebody did it who was not known. So that's the story and within a couple of trips uh, we were able to find the connection through the underground river. At the present time there are two other large systems that are unconnected. There's a Fisher Ridge system which is adjacent to Roppel, and there's the Martin Ridge systems. Yeah. Fisher Ridge is sitting out about 120 miles. I'm not sure how big the other one is, that pro big pistol, and that's probably about 60 miles. Well, it's probably about 45. Miles. There are other nearby caves to Mammoth Cave. The Fisher Ridge Cave System, in largely in Hart County, uh, it's only about 300 feet from passages in, in Roppel Cave, uh, which is also part of Mammoth Cave. So you can see that this 120 mile system that is Fisher Ridge uh, could one day be connected to Mammoth Cave. The Fisher Ridge people are not interested in finding that connection and we understand that, we being the Cave Research Foundation, because we've got plenty of cave to look at for the next 10, 15 years. But one of these days, somebody will find a connection between the two. Uh, in another direction, uh, more to the west and south, is another large cave system called the Wig Pistol Cave System, or Martin Ridge Cave System, that is formed by the finding connections between three different caves. And that cave system is uh, growing steadily. It's, it's undergoing mapping and uh, it's uh, somewhere around 45 or 46 miles long now and, and always growing. Uh, Logsdon River runs through that cave, so we know that one of these days that connection will be made, in which case the whole system will quickly uh, rise from its uh, 100 and, uh, and from its 400 mile length now to 500 miles and uh, Jim Borden and I have predicted it will reach a thousand miles before the end of this century. Could you briefly explain why you managed to have these caves underneath the sandstone ridges but they're gone in the sinkhole plains, the little 
geology background for the people have asked why why is this the longest cave and the answer is that unlike caves in many parts of the country mammoth cave is preserved by a roof rock that acts as a roof of sandstone and shale. Sandstone is very resistant, the shale doesn't allow water to come through. In most parts of the country, caves are really just fragments of former drainage that have been dissected by normal erosion on the surface. This roof rock preserves vast ranges of uh, the cave system that has been developed underneath it. And so, if one can come to a valley, we find that there are vertical shafts that we can go down to the water table, uh, down to the lowest levels uh, near the Green River level, and go underneath the valleys and come up on the other side through vertical shafts uh, into continuations of the cave system. And really that was the uh, secret to finding connections between the caves. They weren't dug, they were all natural connections, but they involved following the water. I'm trying to think of a brilliant question here to ask you. Do you have some brilliant question to ask him, Phoebe? Tell me something brilliant that I haven't thought of yet. <laughs> <laughs> People have wondered why I have been so interested in Stephen Bishop as a cave explorer and it has not much to do with his being an African American, which uh, he, he was one of a number of African American guides at Mammoth Cave, but because he was a terrific cave explorer. Now I say that because he was probably the first systematic cave explorer in this country. He did make a map of the cave to record where he went. Uh, secondly, he was uh, described by people who went on trips with him as a consummate guide. He was not only entertaining, but he had learned things of scientific interest from his many visitors who were college professors and so on, and he had a good memory for that. And thirdly, he was the economic engine, in my opinion, that put Mammoth Cave on the map. His popularity was such that people would write about it, they would write to the newspaper, they would write to their relatives, they would write to people overseas saying, when you take the grand tour of the United States, uh, be sure to go to Mammoth Cave and ask for Stephen Bishop. So he was the generator of a lot of reputation and a lot of uh, revenue, in my opinion, uh, for Mammoth Cave. There were two other slaves who were brought to Mammoth Cave at the same time. There's a Nick Bransford and a Matt Bransford, and they both led tours. Uh, Nick, for example, I believe is the first one people to go to the bottom of the maelstrom and a few places like that. Uh, do you think that Stephen Bishop was, <clears throat> say, given credit for finds are made by other people in order to enhance his reputation? Or do you think that most of the finds were made by Stephen himself? And the second question would be, when he was exploring, do you, was it typically him or was it him and a group of other people when exploring? Do you have any ideas? The question is, what kind of an explorer was Stephen Bishop? Did he do all of this solo on his own, or did he have the assistance of other slave guides? And the answer, I think, is the combination of those. We know, for example, that he did take some trips with his wife Charlotte. Now, why would you take your wife in a cave? Well, because part of the problem of Mammoth Cave was it was so big that logistically you had to uh, stash lamp oil in various parts of the cave that were some distance from an entrance. You couldn't conveniently carry lamp oil in with you for a long trip to some of these places. So I have surmised that he enlisted his wife to help carry those and do exploring on the side. Now there are names 
in other places of the cave, way out beyond the Snowball Room, which is in Cleveland Avenue, we find the name Alfred and Stephen on the wall. Alfred was a contemporary African-American guide to Stephen Bishop. He was owned by the Cron uh, family. He, he was originally sent to Washington, D.C., and uh, there is a letter at, <clears throat> in Louisville, I think in the Filson Club, in which uh, Alfred was sent back because he did some unspeakable crime. Perhaps he drank the whiskey or something, but at any rate, he was sent back and he ended up at Mammoth Cave uh, exploring with uh, Stephen Bishop. So we do know that there's a combination of things. It's very interesting to know that shortly after Stephen Bishop's death in 1857, uh, Nick Bransford <coughs> wrote on the wall, greatest guide of Mammoth Cave still living, or the greatest living guide of Mammoth Cave. In other words, that to me tells me that he was acknowledged as a, a superior explorer at the time, and uh, there was some effort to capitalize on his uh, prowess immediately after his death. Do you have some references that talk about Charlotte going in the cave with Stephen. Uh, I'm just asking yeah. you don't have to. Oh, we know that Stephen took Charlotte into the cave because she has signed her name at various places. Uh, one of the best of those is in a place called uh, Pensacola Avenue, which is just beyond the, the uh, bottomless pit. And you can go out there and you can see that her name is on the wall. And there are several others. I have seen her name out Marion Avenue, which is a long, long way into the cave. And uh, the only way I can see that her name would be written on the wall was, first of all, she wrote it, because it's not in Stephen's handwriting. And secondly, that she was certainly not a paying guide, paying guest. She was, uh, she had to be uh, an assistant to Stephen in some capacity. Can you tell us more about Nick and Matt Bransford? Nick and Matt Bransford were two African-American guides who uh, were brought in as slaves from, uh, they were rented actually from a uh, a white slave dealer named Bransford in Nashville. So that's where they acquired the name Bransford. They were not related in any sense of the word, uh, but they were brought in to help uh, Goran, uh, Stephen's first uh, owner, uh, develop the cave. And they remained afterwards when uh, Dr. Cron bought the cave from Goran. Uh, they remained with the cave and they survived Stephen and uh, continued guiding. Uh, Alfred was an attendant for Dr. Crone's consumption patients in the cave. Yes. He has a nice description <coughs> of it that he tells Doctor um, mm -hmm. about the experiences with the sickly people in the cave. So he was also involved in that aspect of it. Matt Bransford had several sons, Henry, and then he had a Matthew, and there was a William mm -hmm. that all a whole slew of Bransfords after right. Matterson. Alfred was very interesting because we find his name in the cave on the date 1820. And people have said, my, that predates Stephen Bishop, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> it's clear to me that that's his birth date, not, not the date he visited the cave, because he was at the same, same general age as Stephen Bishop. Do you know much about Ed Bishop? who has explored the cave 
he was a guide for 30 years and he was one of the main guide with uh, Max Camper when he mapped the cave. Ed Bishop was a prolific explorer who came many years after Stephen Bishop. Ed Bishop claimed to be the grand nephew of uh, Stephen Bishop, but as far as we can tell, he was a real nephew, not a grand nephew. Uh, and uh, the, probably the relationship goes through an alleged brother that Stephen Bishop had, which we know nothing about. Uh, Ed Bishop was a terrific guide, so that when Max Kemper came to Mammoth Cave and uh, uh, propositioned to management that he would like to produce an accurate map, uh, Ed Bishop was assigned to show Kemper uh, every place in the cave. And so for eight months, Ed Bishop uh, accompanied uh, Max Kemper, a German engineer, in the development of the first truly accurate map of Mammoth Cave. Max also did surface surveys and had some, a lot more notes about his explorations, but the surface surveys and some of his notes have disappeared. Uh, probably because the owners didn't want it to show that the cave extended under other people's properties. Um, just as an aside, did you ever see the website, it's a German website about Max Kemper. They, they traced what happened to him. He was killed in World War I and, and some of the names of places that he assigned, they talk about that and short, short segments of his map on the page. It's a pretty cool. I'm familiar with Max Kemper, who was a German engineer who came to this country, stayed in New York for a while, uh, studying uh, American manufacturing methods, and then he, he was also interested in mining, and he came to Mammoth Cave, and that's when he ended up with the assignment of mapping Mammoth Cave. Uh, he was a uh, quite a, a good engineer, and a good bit has been written about him. Some of it has come to light only recently uh, in the form of uh, uh, people in his family who knew him. There was a symposium in Mammoth Cave at which some of his distant relatives were invited to come and see the places where he went and to see how he had written some of the names of the people in his family uh, in Mammoth Cave. Uh, so, but his contribution was certainly a huge one in bringing order to an understanding of the cave from the schematic map that Stephen Bishop had drawn, which was not to scale. Uh, and indeed, Ed Bishop and and Max Kemper did find that the cave went off the property. And yes, that was hushed up because the management didn't want anybody to know. When George Morrison came around in many years later, uh, eight years later, and said he'd like to see a map of Mammoth Cave, they said, no, you can't see it. And he said, is all the cave on the property? And they said, uh, well, absolutely, all of it is. Well, he had already made some compass and pace determinations uh, on commercial trips through the cave that indeed it could not be all on the property. And uh, so that gave him the inspiration for finding more of Mammoth Cave than was claimed. When do you think the cave was discovered? And Mammoth Cave's uh, beginnings are kind of shrouded in mystery. Uh, in the late 1700s, uh, a series of long hunters uh, explored from Virginia on into the wilds of Kentucky and even into parts of Indiana and so on. And they would be gone a long time with Kentucky rifles and uh, uh, bag game and finally come back. And these were predecessors of Daniel Boone and others, uh, uh, pioneers. Uh, the best thinking is that they knew about Mammoth Cave. Because very early on, the uh, sources of saltpeter for gunpowder 
was one of the economic drivers of exploration of uh, lands out from Virginia. Uh, it was known then that you could uh, get saltpeter from caves. And indeed, some 50 caves in Kentucky were mined for saltpeter, as was Mammoth Cave. Uh, so the earliest maps of Mammoth Cave are called eye draft maps, uh, which are really sketches showing the commercial possibilities of uh, mining saltpeter in, in Mammoth Cave. Some of those are in the DuPont collection and uh, in the Filson Club collection. But those are the earliest sketches we know, and they are around 1795, 97, and so on. So at any rate, the, the, the first things we know are deed records in which Mammoth Cave changes hands, uh, probably in, in lawyer-like uh, transactions to settle the deed, uh, uh, where various people are paid various amounts of money to sign off on, on previous claims for the property. But by 1812 it was well established as a, a cave uh, and uh, a saltpeter manufacturing operation of considerable proportions. Okay. It's not really clear from what I've read that how, what dates the eye drop maps came from. They were from, they're from the DuPont collection, but the one paper places them dating more around 1804 or 1806, and they're, they're undated, and they're in letters that are undated. There is a real nice, a redrafted version of it appeared in like 1856, 1855, when they republished some of Thomas Jefferson's papers and they had a copy of the eye draw map and it was redrafted in that paper, mm -hmm. which is a nice, um, nice copy. Uh, I'm aware there were three of those eye draft maps. Um, you say they have, they have copies of them or at, of all of them at the Filson Historical Society? Probably. Now, uh, Mike Sutton has prepared a uh, manuscript, which is a chapter in a forthcoming book on the mapping of Mammoth Cave, and it's probably the most authoritative uh, study. But he says there are three of those eye draft maps that their dates are not certain because of uh, what you described as uh, the maps not having a date on them. Uh, the, the first sur real survey that we know about was 1835, in which the uh, Fleming Gatewood, who was the manager of the cave at that time, hired a surveyor by the name of Lee from Cincinnati to come down and survey it. And he not only surveyed the cave uh, to the bottom, edge of the bottomless pit, but he also produced uh, uh, sectional profiles of each passageway in the cave uh, because he did a leveling survey as well as a theodolite survey. Well, some of Lee's depths are exaggerated and show some of the pits dropping below the level of the Green River. So there are some inaccuracies because some of the pit depths were determined by barometer and you don't have complete equilibrium with atmospheric pressure in the cave. So there's some air in the barometer things that uh, but I saw reports back from earlier in the 1800s where some people say, oh, it goes underneath the Green River, and other people are saying, that's just silly. Of course it drains to the Green River. It can't be deeper than the Green River. There was a, a map by Nahan Ward that was a hand-drawn map in 1815. Mm. And there was another map called the Green River Cave, probably dating from mm. around... 1818 or so. Oh. I know there's a question there somewhere I was going to ask you, but I've lost it. Come on, Phoebe.
what was the most interesting facts that you found out about Stephen Bishop in your historical research? The most interesting thing I found out about Stephen Bishop in, in my research for this book had to do with uh, a conversation with a professor of African American history at Miami University who said that one reason slavery was described as a peculiar institution had to do with a little known fact that uh, laws and customs varied from town to town, from county to county, and state to state. That in one uh, county uh, you could say about anything and in another county you would be hung from a lamppost for saying that. In other words, African Americans, free or slave, had no idea when the next injustice might strike them. In Kentucky, slavery was uh, different. It was different because uh, plantations were largely non-existent in Kentucky. The lands had been divided many times and were passed on to sons and divided up into smaller plots. And so unlike the South where you had vast cotton fields and so on, uh, in Kentucky the slaves were mostly farmhands, uh, craftspeople, masons, carpenters, uh, domestic servants, and so on. And there, instead of trying to rule by the whip, you'd probably better get along with your uh, servants. Uh, and slaves were more often thought of servants rather than uh, chattel or property, even though that was certainly their legal position. So uh, one of the things I found in, in dealing with uh, the stories by visitors to Mammoth Cave was that sometimes the guards would say tart things. Uh, uh, you know, be careful because we don't want you to get killed going off and getting lost. Well. Uh, you couldn't say that as an African-American slave on a plantation. Uh, nobody would believe you, but in that culture, uh, these guides were the experts. And so Stephen Bishop had an authority about him which was uh, partly due to what he knew and what he had done, but partly due to the social mores of slavery in Kentucky at that time, and I think that's the most unusual thing. I write about uh, Matilda, who is a cook at uh, nearby Bell's Tavern, and uh, she uh, cooks up some corn pone that is especially good because it contains bacon drip. So, uh, so William Bell, who owns the tavern, uh, commands her to make more corn pone because they've gone through what she made. And she says, uh, you know, you're not going to get seconds because uh, you, uh, you, you know, on 25 cents a day, what do you expect? Well, she knew that he was a penny-pinching kind of miser sort of a person, and so she appealed to his pecuniary interest rather than trying to give him a defiant uh, gesture. So that's part of what I learned that really surprised me was the treatment of, uh, of slaves in Kentucky at that time was probably not as cruel as plantation narratives would have you believe. Not to say that slavery was a, a picnic compared to slavery down south. Uh, slavery is uh, an abomination under any form. Uh, I say it's like arguing about the size of the jail cells. A uh, bigger jail cell doesn't make jail any more appealing. A lot of times the guys tell these horrendous stories of people getting lost and falling down pits and getting killed or getting murdered and thrown down pits. Do you think that was just to heighten the appeal in the cave or did it also serve to like keep the tourists in line when the guys told them to not do something? People have uh, described in the past 
in letters and narratives, uh, <clears throat> guides talking about people getting lost, uh, falling down pits, uh, murderers, and so on. And I think this is part of the showmanship of being a guide. Part of, a, of a, an entertaining cave trip is to leave people with memories and memories of what the guide described, the stories he told, the formations he pointed out with his lamp uh, that resembled animals and so on. All of these are part of the showmanship, I think, of guiding. Okay, I'm going to school off a little bit. But this one's still rolling if you want to ask why. Aside from Stephen Bishop and Ed Bishop, are there any of the other earlier guides that stand out in your mind as being accomplished explorers or who found particularly great places in the cave? Maybe you know, who other, what are the other, what are the other guides, if you know of any, who were really involved in actively exploring the cave? Other explorers of Mammoth Cave are few and far between. Uh, they uh, are dotted through history and uh, so we don't know much about what the African-American uh, guides uh, subsequent to Stephen Bishop did or saw other than knowing about Ed Bishop and his uh, taking uh, Max Kemper everywhere. Uh, we know about Leo Hunt and we know about uh, uh, Pete uh, Hansen and uh, the Hunt and Hansen families appear. They, they are Caucasians who had been involved in guiding uh, for many, many years. And uh, at the time they made big discoveries, they were uh, part of the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was put together by Franklin Roosevelt during the Great Depression to provide employment for uh, out-of-work people and young, young men. Uh, but I think the, the problem is that uh, Few cave explorers make significant discoveries, and uh, the significant discovery of today is eclipsed by the significant discovery of tomorrow, and we don't remember who made that discovery. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm all done with questions, okay. I guess. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Or are we One of the uh, drivers of Mammoth Cave had to do with what was going on financially in the United States at various times. During times of prosperity, people traveled times of depression or bank failures, people didn't travel so much. So the fortunes of Mammoth Cave largely go up and down with the uh, financial economics of the times. Uh, at the time that Stephen Bishop was brought to Mammoth Cave, it was a sort of a dump. It was uh, nothing more than a couple of log buildings out in the frontier. You had to take a, uh, a ride on an ox cart or if you were lucky a, a horse uh, drawn buggy would take you there over a rough road. Uh, and then by the time Stephen Bishop uh, died in 1857, uh, Mammoth Cave was starting downhill. The buildings were in disrepair uh, and so on. Uh, well after uh, Dr. Cron's death, uh, Mammoth Cave was run by a, an estate, and the estate hired managers, some of whom they paid on the basis of how much money they could save in expenses. 
So naturally that makes for kind of a, a bad tourist attraction and they would neglect the maintenance. So that's one of the reasons why Morrison, when he came in and built a brand new motel, hotel, he was very successful because the food he served was better and the accommodations were better. George Morrison, uh, when he found his way into Mammoth Cave in, in uh, 1915, had been looking extensively all over the place, going into all kinds of little caves, and Morrison Cave was one of them. And uh, In the 1980s, we discovered that Morrison Cave was connected to Proctor Cave, and then the same year we discovered the connection to Mammoth Cave with Morrison and Proctor. and so. Of this lower Ohio, upper Mississippi, would end up in New Orleans or Memphis or somewhere down here, and then have to come back to Louisville along the uh, Louisville Boat Road uh, back to uh, Louisville and start over with the next bunch of people. So, on this road is where Bell's Tavern was located, and. Uh, you know, right in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there might be older maps than this someplace, but these are the oldest maps I could yeah, find on the collections. And a lot of the really old maps, they scan them just because they're really old maps. Yeah, right. Yeah, wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, I've been doing a lot of this type of research. These, this is the, a Drake map from mm -hmm. 1806 that was pu published in uh, mm. Burton Faust. Okay. Dug that out. And there's the. There's the Max Eight. This, this is the. DuPont. Oh yes, okay, that's the I draft. I draft. And DRA draft. U G H T is is pronounced draft. draft. I know. I I I, I it just sticks in my head wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's just like saying crone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is Krogan versus Kron. 